Okay, so to, to wrap up chapter eight, King of the Mountain, what we're now going to do is we're going to talk about two other types of market structures. We're going to define, so at this point, we've defined perfect competition on one end, one baseline. We've defined monopoly on the other end of the baseline. And now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about two markets which are in between things, right? And again, that's more realistic, right? There aren't very many perfectly competitive markets. There aren't very many unitary monopolist markets. Most markets operate in between them. And so the markets that we'll discuss here are actually the markets that we see in the real world. Um, so the, the most common market as it pertains to number of businesses um, would be markets which are monopolistically competitive. Right? So what does monopolistically competitive mean? The big thing with monopolistic competition is that we take perfect competition and those four assumptions and we remove the homogenous goods assumption. So the homogenous goods assumption says that the, the product in question is virtually identical across firms. There's no discernible difference between a product, whether you buy it at Bodega A or whether you buy it at Bodega B, right? Let's think about pizza places for a moment, New York City pizza places. Let's imagine that every single place in New York City char uh, uh, charges the same price for pizza and the pizza is exactly the same quality, taste, and everything across every pizza place, which we know doesn't isn't real, but let's imagine that that would be the case. Well, if that was the case, then the pizza market would be perfectly competitive, and you know the outcomes would be what we would predict. In reality, in the New York City pizza market, there are subtle, uh, sometimes significant differences across different pizza places, and this enables some pizza places to charge higher prices. A good example of this is right near me. Uh, I live right across the street from Brooklyn College. And so just a few blocks away from me is Defara Pizza, which is often regarded as one of the better pizza places in New York City. It always is put on the lists and everything. It's one of those destination pizza places, right? So the line is always super long and a slice of pizza costs you $5, right? That's five even for New York City. Um, there at Pace University, my favorite pizza place is Pronto Pizza, um, and you can get a slice of pizza there for for two fifty, right? So why is the why is a a financial district pizza place charging a lower price than a you know Midwood Brooklyn pizza place? And it's because Defara has market power, specifically because people think their pizza is different. They think that they have a differentiated product. So if we remove the product differentiation assumption from perfect competition, this changes what we expect that market to look like. In particular, if you are able to differentiate your product, at least in the short run, this gives you monopoly power. Okay, now why is that? Why would this give you monopoly power? Because it gives people an additional reason to consume your good that has nothing to do with whether you're cheaper. So in the perfectly competitive sense, you would choose to buy from uh, one company over another one only if those two companies were charging different prices and you would buy the, the, the least priced, uh, buy from the least priced um, company. In the context of Defara, right, they have this brand loyalty, they have this market power that stems from product differentiation. As a result, a slice at Defara is $5. Whereas a slice at virtually almost all other pizza places in New York City is usually around two to four dollars. So they use that market power, that brand loyalty, to at least suggest that their product is different from other pizza places, right? And so because their product is different, this gives them monopoly power. Okay? And again, remember, monopoly power is price setting power. That's the main thing. When we say a firm has market power or we say a firm has monopoly power, it doesn't mean the firm is a monopolist. It just means that they have the ability to set prices. And so there's really good evidence that Defara has brand loyalty and has a differentiated product because they're able to sell their pizza at higher prices than most other pizza places. So this is a great example of a firm which exists in a monopolistically competitive market so this is a market that has all the other assumptions of, of perfect competition with the exception of homogenous goods. And so we have heterogeneous goods in a monopolistically competitive market, meaning that we have product differentiation and those firms that have differentiated products enjoy monopoly profits, um, at least in the short run. But then the story goes like this, because there's still perfect information, because remember, we haven't gotten rid of any other assumption other than that homogenous goods assumption. So we're going to allow products to be different, but we're still going to assume many buyers, many sellers. We're going to continue to assume perfect information, free entry and exit. We see that other firms 
see those profits being earned by the monopolist and they enter the market, okay? So in the short run, which you can see here to the left, um, Defara behaves like a monopolist, okay? Um, but then over time, maybe uh, another pizza place, you know, sends their employees to go taste Defara so they can figure out what are they doing that makes their pizza so different from everyone else. And if, if, if other pizza places can, can start to, um, uh, you know, offer pizza that, that people consider to be just as good as Defara, this is going to cause Defara's monopoly power to go away. Um, and you see this to the right, um, the blue line is Defara's initial demand. Um, and this is demand specifically for Defara pizza in the short run. But then because there's perfect information and free entry and exit, we expect other firms to enter the market and start offering pizza just like Defara. Um, a really good example of this is like uh, the uh, fancy candle market. So if you ever like go to fancy candle stores, you know, they always charge these like exorbitantly high prices for fancy candles. And one of the things you'll see uh, is that oftentimes like a candle store will have like some new type of scent. Like I've gone into some candle stores in the last few years and like they've had, you know, beer based candles like IPA candles or stout candles. And then I saw other candle stores not related to the, to the first one. I saw them also have beer um, candles, their own beer candles. So there was clearly this product differentiation, which was being replicated, mimicked by other candle producers, right? And so what this meant was that maybe the candle store had this like monopoly power because nobody else was making beer candles. And then over time, they lose that monopoly power. So Defar is the same way, right? They have that monopoly power now, which enables them to charge a higher price. But over time, we would in fact expect Defara to lose that monopoly power. And in fact, in recent years, apparently Defara's financials are not looking that good. Um, they've had some issues with some tax concerns, um, which usually when firms start having problems with taxes, it means they're not making as much money anymore. And so I have to wonder if what's happening to Defara is simply that they're losing that monopoly power. And, they're, and I wonder if they're gonna continue being able to sell their pizza for as expensive as they currently sell it for. Um, so far they are, um, but you know, we'll, we'll see. And again, the way that we show that is that firms enter the market and they take Defara's demand. So normally Defara had this demand curve here, this all the way out here to the right, this the blue stripe demand curve. But then when other firms entered the market, this caused the demand that Defara had access to to decline. And so now Defara doesn't have as much demand for their pizza. Um, and as you'll notice, this would cause in fact Defara to now charge a lower price. So if Defara does lose their monopoly power, we would see that by them in fact lowering uh, the price of their pizza to, to below what it is today. The big takeaway with monopolistic competition is that firms can sometimes earn short run profits uh, even if they exist in competitive markets, by differencing their products, by differentiating their products, by you know maybe creating a new product or creating a better version of an already existing product. Um, however, because these are still competitive markets, over time we expect that firm to lose that market power. So under monopolistic competition, you sort of start out with, uh, you know, deadweight loss and, and monopoly power. But over time, we expect those markets to become not only competitive, but also efficient. So they sort of start out. So in the short run, they're monopolies. And then as we move into the long run, they become monopolistic, they, they become perfect competitors. So that's kind of the story of monopolistic competition is that you differentiate your product, you earn monopoly profits for a little bit, but because of perfect information and free entry and exit, we expect those profits to ultimately uh, go away. And our assumption is that in perfectly, I'm sorry, monopolistically competitive markets in the long run, they behave just like perfectly competitive markets. And so profits are gonna be driven to zero. And again, I, I think that, that the FARA might be experiencing that right now. Um, so if they're not doing well with their taxes, that may mean that you might be seeing cheaper Defara pizza, um, which would be great for consumers, right? That would be really good. All right. Um, on the other side is, so if we think about uh, monopolistic competition, it's very close to perfect competition, 
right? So, so perfect competition and, and monopolistic competition are close to each other. Um, the difference is, is that there's product differentiation, which gives some firms monopoly power in the short run, but because the markets are still competitive, we expect that monopoly power to go away in the long run. If we continue to edge closer to the monopoly side, we hit what we refer to as an oligopoly. An oligopoly is a market which is defined as a few number of firms, not many and not one. So again, it's in between perfect competition and monopoly, although closer to monopoly than it is close to perfect competition. And what we're interested in in the context of oligopoly is market concentration, meaning that we're interested in to what extent do the firms in that market have market power and therefore have monopoly power. And again, remember, even if there is so-called competition, if there's only a few number of firms and each of those firms has market power, the ultimate effect on consumers and the overall health of the economy will be very, very similar to what would happen under a monopolist, right? So it doesn't really matter that Target and Walmart both exist. Both of those companies exert their own market power, make it very difficult for small stores to exist in cities and towns. And as a result, you know, where Walmart and Target show up, you tend to see a reduction in options for consumers. And in, in, in a way, they almost get these sort of captured consumers. Um, the herfindahl hertzman Index, uh, otherwise known as HHI, is simply a measure of market concentration. And so what we do is we simply take the market share. So what is market share? Market share is the extent to which uh, it, consumers in a given market buy from you, right? So if you look at like telecommunications, um, you know, AT&T, Verizon, they have huge market shares, meaning that most consumers in the telecommunications market buy from AT&T or Verizon. And there's some other firms there as well, but they have a huge amount of market share. And so the HHI index is just a way for us to calculate this. It's just, you know, taking individual market shares and squaring them and adding them up. You'll see here, imagine we have four firms and they each split the market evenly, meaning there's 25% of the market share across the four firms, you'll see that the HHI index is 2,500, which is pretty high, by the way, because there's only four firms and they control the entire market. Um, but notice that if, if we have four firms, uh, one market has or one firm has 70% market share, while the other three have 10%, you'll see that the, the HHI is larger because there's more concentration amongst the singular firm. So the HHI just becomes our way of measuring the level of market concentration in a given market, um, which in, in market concentration is gonna be based upon how much market share uh, relative to the number of firms um, that exist in a given market. Um, these are just the, these are current HHI scores in these given industries. So these would all be what we would refer to as oligopolistic markets. Um, beer is interesting because in, in recent years, you've had the dramatic increase in small breweries, although it's still a market which is dominated by those large beer companies, what the, the, the folks in the craft beer um, industry call uh, BMC, Bud Miller Coors. Um, they still have tremendous market power. But you see airline industries, appliance markets, broadband services, health insurance, medical devices. These are very, very important industries. Lots and lots and lots of money gets spent in these industries each year. And we can see that they're uh, you know, fairly heavily marketly, market concentrated. Um, the actual Department of Justice guidelines for mergers and acquisitions, this is whether we allow a merger or acquisition to occur is based upon the HHI score. And so if, if the result of a merger or acquisition uh, is between 1,500 and 2,500, we would consider that moderately concentrated. Um, and anything above 2,500 is considered highly concentrated. And, and the attempt is, is to prevent mergers and acquisitions in markets which are already above 2,500. Um, I should tell you, over time, we've become a little bit more accepting of mergers and acquisitions than we, we historically have. Um, and, and so in the last 40 to 50 years, we've allowed a lot more mergers and acquisitions than we did before. And so in a sense, we've allowed markets to become much more concentrated um, over time. And so we're currently in a situation now in the US where the, the vast majority of the amount of money we spend on an annual basis goes to oligopolistic markets. Now, you may remember that when I talked about monopolistic competition, I said most businesses existed in monopolistically competitive markets. That's true. 
We spend more money though in oligopolistic markets. So oligopolies, unfortunately, and, and this is not just true in America, but it's true in, in many other countries, oligopolistic markets make up the majority of the money we spend. So clothing companies, grocery stores, automobile companies, um, computer companies. You think about all the, the big ticket items we buy on an annual basis, and you'll realize that you're buying from markets that have high amounts of market concentration, and, and therefore those markets are, are less efficient as a result. So the more market concentration, the more those markets are going to tend to behave as if they were monopolist markets, and therefore the more uh, deadweight loss that we tend to have. So the higher the market concentration, the more deadweight loss that we have. This is, of course, why the Department of Justice um, only allows mergers and acquisitions if the HHI score is, is below a certain threshold. Although, although, again, over time, the Department of Justice has become much more reticent to deny mergers and acquisitions, but this is the process um, that, that goes through it. The, the concern is, of course, is that if you have a small number of firms already in a market, and then if you allow a merger uh, between one, two of those firms, what we call a horizontal merger, that is firms that are supposed to be competitors now become one firm. Uh, this, of course, leads to even more market power for that one firm, even more monopoly power. And over time, of course, if you just allowed mergers and acquisitions, again, if you just treat it like a free market, you would ultimately end up with a monopoly most likely because firms always kind of find it in their best interest to merge with each other. Again, there's the sort of mythology of, of the industrious human wanting to be competitive with each other. At the end of the day, people want money. And if AT&T and Verizon are allowed, and if, if it's in their best interest to merge, they're, they're happy to merge. Um, you know, again, th this is all about profit maximization. There's, there's no, we're not really worried about anything else in this particular context. So, and, and it would be a bad thing if we allowed AT&T and Verizon to merge together. Um, and so we would prevent that. Um, but this is not always the case. We, we certainly allow certain mergers and acquisitions um, to exist, right? So, Here's some re recent ones. These are in the last uh, 15, 20 years. CBS and Viacom, uh, $12 billion uh, afterwards. Uh, Schwab and TD Ameritrade, these are investment houses. Uh, BB&T SunTrust, these are banks. Disney, 21st century, um, so on and so forth. We allowed these mergers to go on. Um, and, and they were gigantic businesses merging with other gigantic businesses. So again, we have this regulatory power to prevent market concentration. Um, and we used to, you know, sort of post-industrial revolution, kind of, you know, after the, there was the trust busting era under Teddy Roosevelt or sort of before and after Teddy Roosevelt in the early 1900s, where we took the, the steel companies and the railroad companies and we literally broke them up into many different companies. So we took these large corporations in the early 1900s and we literally broke them up into small companies. Um, this happened a little bit also under FDR as well. So those Roosevelts, they're not fans of, of monopolies, so to speak. And that was kind of the way we treated things for a long time. And then in the 1980s, uh, just sort of the general deregulatory behavior of the Reagan administration um, led to a, a sort of acquiescence of that regulatory power. And we started allowing a lot more mergers and acquisitions um, as a result. And that's at least partly the reason why, or at least you know, that's the main reason why we have such a market concentration now in these oligopolistic markets. It's why you hate your cable company. It's why you hate your cell phone company and they provide terrible customer service because they don't have to worry about good customer service. If you have monopoly power, not only do you get to charge your consumers higher prices, but you don't have to worry about helping them much because what are you going to do? You're going to go to somewhere else? When I moved into my apartment, I think I mentioned this in the other class, when I moved into my apartment, I didn't have a choice. Uh, what cable company. If I wanted cable, if I wanted internet, I had to buy from Verizon. If, if Verizon knows that they have a whole uh, potential consumer base that doesn't have a choice, that has to buy their product, why do they have to make sure that their product is good? Why do they have to keep the price of their product low? They don't. And so market power is bad for consumers, and it also reduces the, the overall efficiency um, of the market.